Hello and welcome to finally uh, the review of the Wind in the Willows feature film. Uh, now this kicks off uh, the reviews of the entire series. wanted to start with the film of course. Um, as I've said before, uh, I'm going to start reviewing uh, the series uh, from spring, so from Sunday the 3rd of March. It'll be an episode a week. Uh, I'm going to explain how that all works um, separately. Uh, but for this, uh, and all the series rather, I'm going to be doing video reviews. So I'm basically going to be talking to you in a video like this uh, for each and every episode. And down the bottom, just down here, as you can see, uh, I've got an image there at the moment, there we go. Uh, I'm going to be having the footage of the actual episode I'm talking about. And there might be some other bits and bobs I might put up to. Um, but basically the text for the blog will focus on the actual uh, mat uh, material that I found, behind the scenes material and so on. Uh, but the review itself for every episode will be in the form of a video like this, uh, sort of live as I'm playing it. So I hope you enjoy them. This of course is a fairly long one because it is the film, uh, whereas all the others will be around 20 minutes each. Uh, but let's uh, play the film then. So I'm going to literally hit play here. I've got the, vi the film in front of me and it will start at the same time in the corner just down here. Now, so with the feature film, uh, Thames logo of course, so Thames Television uh, obviously uh, owned Cosgrove Hall in the 1980s, so everything Cosgrove Hall made was for Thames Television. And uh, this, as I already said in the blog, is a wonderful opening to the feature film of The Wind in the Willows. As you can see, we start with an Edwardian photo album, we zoom into it uh, very, very slowly and gently, and we're surrounded with artefacts that are very Edwardian. The book opens, of course, and we delve into this, this world accompanied by this beautiful uh, theme music by uh, Keith Hopwood and Malcolm Rowe. Now the Wind of the Willows came to be uh, because um, Brian and Mark really wanted to do it, particularly Mark. Uh, he was all about the classics, adaptations and so on. And uh, chairman at uh, Thames Television, a guy called Brian Cowgill, um, approached them after a screening of Cinderella, which they'd made um, not too long before, and basically said to them, well lads, what do you want to do next? Uh, and uh, Mark said, oh, we'd love to do The Wind in the Willows. And Brian just said, that's it then. Do The Wind in the Willows. And it was as simple as that. Um, unheard of these days, you know, to, for a project to be made, um, you know, like that, just just very quickly. Um, you know, they didn't have to pitch for it. Uh, they didn't have any competition. Uh, the story was just coming out of copyright, uh, just coming up to 75 years after its publication. Um, so the timing was right. And also they were pushing uh, kind of the mechanical side of, of, and the engineering of, of puppets, uh, which we'll talk about as we see the characters. Uh, so we delve into this, all these um, stills, the stills photography, and eventually into a hole in the ground. Um, and those who know the story well know that the first character uh, that we meet is Mole. Um, this is a lovely, I love this introduction. We don't see any characters uh, just yet, we see uh, the kind of the, the the home of Mole or the garden to start with, um, and then then of course we revealed uh, uh, the the name of the place, Mole End. And there we go, first bit of animation, duster flicking, and that's Mole. I love that he's humming <laughs> the theme music of the Wind and the Willows. Lovely touch. Obviously a late decision there, I think. And there we go, the first ever puppet animation, and there's Mole himself. Now the puppets um, were very, very, you know, top-notch. You know, but at this point, Costco Hall had um, done a fair bit of puppet animation, uh, but it, all of it was fairly simplistic. Uh, they just started uh, Cockle Shell Bay. Uh, they'd, they'd already finished Cinderella and the Pipe Pipe of Hamlin, which won a BAFTA. Um, and that's where things started to take off, but I think the Wind in the Willows, uh, you know, that I still think to this day that they are um, some of the best puppets McKinnon and Saunders ever made. Weren't known as McKinnon and Saunders then. Uh, uh, Peter Saunders and Ian McKinnon actually worked for Costco for, uh, kind of led the development of these these puppets, these these armatures, and then later formed the company McKinnon and Saunders, and they went on to, um, you know, uh, make puppets for numerous projects including um, the big feature films uh, made by Tim Burton 
they're very renowned now. Uh, but even today, these puppets are so impressive. I mean, Mole hasn't really started speaking yet, but the lip sync on them is, is quite extraordinary and the expressions you can get with them. And that's all down to that, that marvellous sort of, um, you know, articulation in the, in the skeletons, the armatures. Now, some of these costumes that Mole, Mole has still exist today, that apron, that blue apron. Um, I'll put an image up of that, but that, that exists today. Uh, I love this <laughs> bit of humour. This is typical of the, the Wind and the Willows humour in the book, and of course they translated it well. Look at the amount of sugars he's putting into his tea. He's almost distracted already. Um, now, interesting as well, uh, this scene uh, in the book is very, very brief. I mean, in most editions, it doesn't even go beyond the first page. Uh, we just know that Mole is spring cleaning and he's getting a bit tired of it, a bit fed up. Keep saying bother and hang spring cleaning and all of that. But in this film, we, I, I love that the time is taken to really introduce us to Mole and his environment and the fact that he's getting a bit, a bit irritated, a bit fed up. He's looking around, there's so much to do. Um, and then, of course, he responds to the sounds outside. Now, I thought it would be very fitting that um, I not only start these reviews with the film, but at this time of year, we're obviously just about to come out of winter of 2019, and we're about to go into spring, which is when we kick off with a very spring-like episode, which would be the Ghost, ghost at Mole End, like I say, on the 3rd, the 3rd of March. So, Mole leaves his home. Another thing to note in the animation, in, in those days, um, generally, each character was, well, each animator was allocated a character. So you'd have one particular animator on Mole, uh, one on Ratty, and so on. Uh, and I believe Mole was animated primarily by an animator called Andrea, Andrea Lord, who I uh, later worked with. Uh, she later uh, did costumes for Costco for and many projects. Uh, like I say, I worked on quite a few with, with her. Um, and yeah, she primarily animated Mole. And there we are, here's Mole into the, um, the outdoors. Beautiful sets already, beautiful, um, you know, way of showing us this world that these, these animals live in. Uh, and then we of course have the, we have the river, um, quite a well-known story about the tank that was built for this, but I'll tell it anyway. Uh, the river, the water itself, isn't just water because it's, it would be impossible to animate on water because it would be too many ripples. So they had to thicken it, they had to make it um, into like a gel so that you could move things like boats across it without it going out of control because obviously stop motion by the nature of it is frame by frame. So they, they found um, some kind of gel they got from the chemist um, that set it like a like a jelly, like thickened it up. Uh, but the problem they had was the smell. <laughs> the smell apparently was awful, and every now and then they had to scrape the tank out and, and start again because it would go off. Uh, so they had to have quite a strict uh, schedule, I think, with the shooting on it. Um, but as you can see, the results are, are absolutely marvellous. Um, it's totally um, we totally accept that as water as a river. Now, a thing to note about the animation as well, they were learning these days, a few physical things that go wrong, like the boat suddenly moving forward there. Um, and here's interesting, that's a miniature puppet of Mole there. So they did have mini ones, probably about about this big, I say, whereas the um, the full puppets were about, about this big. Um, so they, they tend to use the smaller puppets for wider shots, um, so that the wide, big sets could actually be made smaller and obviously the budgets would get, would get down. Um, and uh, not, not so much common practice today. Um, I mean, false perspective is used today with sets and you know, backgrounds and so on, but, but not so much with puppets. Um, but it does work, it's, it works with those wide shots. But of course, for all close-ups like these and mid-shots, um, it tends to be the, the bigger puppets. Although we had a shot of Mole then, I think, when we had some smaller puppet. So we are introduced to Ratty here. Um, uh, or didn't mention who voices Mole, uh, Richard Pearson, uh, wonderful actor. Uh, he's just Mole, so such a perfect choice for Mole. Um, he's just got that lovely, warm, gentle tone. Uh, Ratty is voiced by Ian Carmichael, 
Um, and in fact, Ian Carmichael did not uh, voice Ratty in the series. Uh, there's a story behind that. Uh, quite a sad story, actually. His wife sadly passed away, um, and he he couldn't face being in a room full of actors on a regular basis because uh, they'd all be asking, "Oh, I'm very sorry," and he just he didn't want, couldn't cope with that really. Uh, it was Mark Hall himself who told me that. Um, so very sad, but he still wanted to be involved because he was, he loved the project. So in the series, there was a ro the role of narrator, and Ratty. Uh, sorry, not Ratty, Ian. Ian Carmichael was offered the role of narrator, which could all be done, um, you know, he's just on his own recording, um, which is perfect, and he's perfect as the narrator. I mean, he's wonderful as Ratty as well. But I think when Peter Salis came on board, somehow the characters gelled together more somehow, I think. Um, nothing against Ian Carmichael's Ratty, but I think on reflection, he is better placed as the narrator. Um, I love the way this is shot, uh, look at the decisions that Mark Hall made, I mean Mark Hall directed this, Chris Taylor was the animation director, but look how soft and gentle it is, there's a lot of pull focus, a uh, lot of dissolves between shots, very few actual cuts, and that's important because it, it, it gives it a warm nostalgic feel, a feeling that we're just drifting through life um, with these characters, carefree sort of atmosphere. Um, and the sense that time is just passing and there's not a care in the world. Um, that's a lovely shot of an example of the props, you know, the attention that went into the props, everything, the props, the costumes, the sets, I mean the attention to detail in The Wind and the Willows is, is extraordinary and I think one of the very big reasons uh, for me loving, loving it so much, um, I responded to it as a child, just this, this, this realism. And if you look at it, if comparing, comparing it to any other, literally any other TV series, animated TV series, it is so realistic. It's not stylized. They, they were aiming for complete realism. And the, even the, the characters themselves, the puppets, um, you know, they are human characters, but with animal masks most of the time. And at other times they appear more like uh, kind of animals. With, with human characteristics, if that makes sense. So, uh, which is all kind of very true to the book, and a lot of illustrators have struggled to know quite how to illustrate the book for those reasons. You know, are they human scaled? Are they animal scaled? And even in this film, we get a sense of of both, but primarily they seem to be human scaled because um, they are really humans. But I love that they've still got these animal traits. So here we go. There's Badger. Uh, Sometimes I even now I forget that Badger is introduced quite early on, but we don't really meet him properly till, till much later. But Badger, voiced by Sir Michael Horden, um, sadly died way back in 1995, but wonderful British actor. Um, there's the Wildwood, scary place. First hint of darkness, um, so, so of course you do need the darkness for the lightness to work. Um, sunshine and shadow, as it, as it states in the... Um, Closing theme music in the series, and then we uh, we're about to meet the weasels, um, who were well, the two main weasels who were going to become fantastic double acts in the series. There's the chief weasel. Not everybody knows that he was voiced by David Jason. Uh, you do hear Toad in him every now and then, but wonderful, wonderfully cast as the chief weasel, and the other weasel voiced by Brian Schumann, who actually wrote uh, most of the scripts for the series. Uh, but Brian Truman is um, something of a legend. Uh, I mean, he's so key to Crossgrove Hall's history. He not only wrote The Wind in the Willows, but wrote a um, heck of a lot of Danger Mouse scripts, Count Duckula, um, Cockleshell Bay. I mean, the, the list goes on. Uh, and he did so many voices for all of those as well. He did all the voices for Jamie and the Magic Torch as well. And, uh, and I know him fairly well. I met him a few times, lovely man. Um, lovely to just chat about his memories. He's so witty as well. I mean, he would be. He's a fantastic script director and he gets such humour into his scripts. But we'll talk about Brian a lot more as we get into the series. Um, as this film kind of goes on, it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about the differences between the book um, and this adaptation. 
Uh, I mean, there are a few adaptations of this story uh, for film and TV. Um, and usually uh, the same chapters from the book are omitted, um, left out, mainly because they aren't essential to the story. Um, those two chapters being uh, Wayfarers All and The Piper at the Gates of Dawn. But also there's a chapter called The Further Adventures of Toad in the book, um, and a lot of the material in that was, was left out. Uh, so, um, but that's common uh, because it would have been a very, very long film with those. But uh, Costco Fall beautifully adapted them into episodes in the series, which of course we'll talk about when we, when we come to them. Uh, but here we have a first major difference. Uh, there's a lot of material in the book that hasn't come up so far, such as uh, Otter. We don't meet a character called Otter in the film. We do in the series, but not in the film. In the film as well, we do see Toad already by this point, like we just met Badger. Um, in the book, we've already seen Toad going far, uh, past on a, uh, on a boat, I believe, trying his best at rowing, hopelessly. <laughs> um, and also a lot of time goes by in, in the story. Um, and Mole one day asks Ratty, I would really like to go meet Mr Toad. And that's on another day. Uh, Mole has already been staying with Ratty for quite a while. Whereas in the film, of course, this is all taking place on the same day. So on the face of it, a lot happens for Mole in one day. He discovers the joys of the outside world, the spring. He meets Ratty, uh, he meets Badger briefly the weasels and now he's about to meet Toad so a lot happened um, but of course uh, things always need adapting and changing for film but out of all the adap adaptations made of this story um, many people including myself regard this as the definitive one um, it is so true to the book or as true as it can be for, for the film to work and to not be too overdone, you know, over complicated. You need to remember there needs to be a, a thread, you know, a storyline and it's primarily about about Toad. I should mention this this music here. Um, this this is kind of an interlude beautifully shot with all these these ducks. Uh, I love the lighting effects, the sparkles. Uh, but this song, Duck Stitty, was in the, the original book and there are a number of songs in this film with lyrics that do derive from from the book itself and I think that's just wonderful and the melodies that Keith Hopwood and Malcolm Rowe found are just, just beautiful, just wonderful. You listen to this melody if you can, I know I'm talking a lot. Lovely, um, lovely little song and introduces us to Ratty Moore, you know, his love of music and there's Toad Hall of course across the way. Um, Look at the water effects as well, they did all these water effects, you see all that on the boat, the kind of flickery effect that you would get naturally. Uh, I mean the attention to detail is extraordinary. hate to criticise the animation but that flag is going backwards at the, at the moment. Um, and there we have a beautiful set, Toad Hall. Now this was actually designed and made quite late on and the Costco people were getting slightly concerned that they were going behind schedule. And this hadn't even been designed yet, let alone built. So obviously it's a key, a key piece in the film. And a, and a guy, a theatre designer called Terry Brown was brought on and designed it. And did a beautiful job. But there we have Mr. Toad himself. Um, Mr. Uh, Toad was uh, animated primarily, uh, well, I think completely actually in the film by Barry Purvis, who went on to become a, a renowned uh, stop motion filmmaker. Uh, and um, and I've worked with him. I worked with Barry, lovely guy, um, lovely um, sort of warm personality. He loves his craft and loves theatre. That's his first love, really. Uh, and Toad, of course, voiced by David Jason, who'd already vo already voiced Danger Mouse and would also voice in the future Count Dracula, the BFG Hugo in Victor and Hugo, and also. We've already mentioned the Chief Weasel in this, and a character called Billy Rabbit, that not everyone knows, uh, who appears in the series. Um, and this is very true to the book, The Open Road chapter. Uh, Toad, he's just met Mole, of course, but 
they're very enthusiastic, or Toad is anyway, about um, going on a caravan trip and he's got this beautiful gypsy caravan that he's acquired. But Ratty's already going, oh no, he's, he's kind of, you know, it's another craze that, that Toad, ha Toad has and it's typical of Toad and of course this, a lot of the series is based around that. And I love this opening shot here. Now many people who know me well know that this scene means more to me than any other. Um, I I was introduced to this film when I was probably about five years old and I mean I loved the whole film but out of everything this scene stuck with me the most. I think it was a combination of the song that they're singing here, the open road, the, clink, the, clink, the clanging of all the pots and pans but more than anything that beautiful caravan, I mean I just fell in love with it. Um, beautiful colour, just the tinge in the detail, I mean look at that detail. Absolutely beautiful, and it stuck with me that, that yellow, iconic colour, and and I think, and I've got the uh, film, which will release of the film here on VHS. I wanted it so badly, we rented it. I remember from a video shop, um, and my nan, it was my nan who actually, um, in the end, actually phoned up Thames Video because she couldn't find it in the shop for some reason, um, and yeah she knew exactly what she was talking about she said oh, it's the one with the open road <laughs> and they knew exactly what she meant so I got that for my birthday I think I must have been six or seven years old or something like that I mean it was actually the video came out in 1986 so it couldn't have been uh, before then uh, but yeah I love that it was the case was the same color as the caravan I just love that I just don't know what it was about it but you know when things stick with you as a child the rest is history as they say <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, talking about the songs again, this is the only song in the film that didn't come from the original book. This was specially written, so music and lyrics, and I believe uh, that Rosemary Ann Sisson, who adapted the script, wrote the script, actually contributed the lyrics. So she worked closely with Keith Hopwood and Malcolm Rowe, and um, it was released as a, as a single. I've got the, uh, the single, the record in there, uh, along with the theme tune from the series. Um, and it's a wonderful, jolly song, and I can see why it was put in. Um, it needed a song. I mean, in total, there's five songs. It's almost, a, you could almost call this a musical. There are five songs in this film, and it needed one at this point because the next one is is a while yet. Um, and it's a nice slow way before we get into where the real story begins with Toad and his craze of, of motor cars. And of course, it, in, it gives us a chance to appreciate Toad and the relationship, the friendly relationship he has with uh, Ratty and Mole. So it's very important to establish that. So a song, if you think of the point, point of view of a story, is a great way to, to gel them for us, the audience. And here we go, this is where everything changes. He's dreaming, and then of course he hears the motor car. His first, well not his first, but the craze that really takes over, takes over the story then. That horse, by the way, apparently was a pain to animate. Um, the armature, well, the bulk of the armature still exists today. Um, minus the legs and the head, it's just basically the body, it's just a chunk like this. Um, I'll, I'll put photos of it up in the archive. Um, I love that touch there, the wheel going round, so that attention to detail. Uh, and the shadows going over the toe there, very beautifully lit. And this is a great example in animation where less is more. And you can see how little Toad is moving because he's in a trance at the moment. And there, he's, when he's got dialogue, of course, he moves more. So it's known when to, as an animator, it's known when to kind of keep things still and let things read poses and thinking time for the characters. Um, something I've developed over the years as an animator to try and get that understanding of, of not keeping your animation too cluttered. Here we go, the first of many cars for Toad. And that's the miniature Toads. We talked about the miniature puppets, that would be the miniature one. Um, so obviously that helps them have sets that appeared bigger, they could obviously make them smaller to be in scale. Shots like that would have been miniature cars, I believe. I love the ladybird here, <laughs> spinning around. 
Um, and this music echoes or is kind of preempts a later song, the iconic song that Toad sings uh, much later in the film. Now, if you look here, the steam, so that steam going up would have been done on a pane of glass in front of camera. Kind of common practice, actually, I don't think it's really practiced so much today, but in those days, obviously, it's all before computers and things, so you couldn't easily overlay something on as a special effect like that other than doing the camera, but it's a wonderful, wonderful charm to that. Next card. Now what I love about this and what The Wind in the Willows is all about as well is the changing seasons. So we've already gone through spring kind of into summer and as you can see this is now autumn. So this is kind of a montage, these sequences obviously telling us that this is over quite a long passage of time. Toad is obsessed with these cars all through the seasons. Um, so whereas all the previous events took place in one day, we're now progressing steadily forward. <laughs> just, just the animation of the leaves and so on, all of that. And I think this is one of the most beautiful shots uh, that Barry, I believe, would have done of Toe's legs. Just listen to this. <coughs> that soundtrack with the legs perfectly marries together and the way the legs just disappear into the hay. <laughs> So with this pass of time, obviously, it also further establishes a relationship between Ratty and Mole. And we can see that Mole is still staying with Ratty. Or, we believe that. And here, of course, winter. So, snow was a very particular powder that they, they had. Uh, but they tried to, um, you know, keep the snow uh, scenes till the end of shooting. Um, because, of course, you mess up the sets. And it's a real pain to um, remove the snow afterwards. We have some field mice there, we meet properly later on. There's a cap that Toad was wearing there that still exists today, so I can put a picture of that up. Miniatures of Ratty and Mole, so that, that quite iconic set of Ratty's house was at a smaller scale, because it, otherwise it would have been huge. Um, but they realised a lot of the shooting could be with those miniatures, just because it's for, for wide shots. Lovely. When it was shown on TV, I believe this is where adverts, commercials would have been made, just makes sense to me. So we've had a lot of action, and then now we go into a, a slow scene with Ratty and Mole, and this is another element of The Wind in the Willows that I, I, I truly love, it's what, a, what it's about, it's the cosiness, the warmth. Winter in The Wind in the Willows isn't about the coldness, it's about the cosiness of being indoors and keeping the coldness outside um, and look at that how cosy that is ratty mole around the fire um, toasting some bread very nice very warm there's a lovely um, painting that Brian Costco did um, back in 2004 I'm lucky enough to have a, a print of it uh, which sums up a thing like this it's the four characters gathered around a fire so you can imagine it's probably Winter outside, blistery, blistery weather, blustery weather rather, uh, very cold, and they're all cosy indoors, and there's a lot of warm oranges and beautiful. I should, I'll put an image up. Um, and this is very true to the book. Um, Mole very keen on going to meet Mr. Badger, because Mole's a very um, inquisitive fellow, um, and of course he's worried about Toad, so he decides to venture into the wildwood alone, which turns out to be a mistake, but it's all happy in the end. Love the light there, see the, the sun in the background there and that gentle pink sky, there would have been backlight um, through a screen to get that effect, they've used that in numerous episodes as well. Now I don't know if this weasel, if they intended this to be a main character later on in the series, I mean it is it seems, it seems that the series um, had already been commissioned uh, while the film was in production, um, which kind of makes sense. 
uh, because the film was released, uh, well it was shown on TV in December 1983, um, on the 27th I think of December, and the, the series was shown, uh, well it began in April of 1984, so there's no way they would have sh shot those episodes between the film premiering and that. So um, yeah, it would have been, the series would have been in production, um, I guess before this was released. Uh, and they had a premiere for the film as well in um, at the ABC. Well, it was the ABC Theatre then in along Shaftesbury Avenue in London. Uh, I believe in December as well. So before it was shown on TV, and of course all the cast and crew were invited. Uh, and there is footage of that. I'll try and put footage of that on here at some point. Now this, this scene's got a lovely sort of creepiness to it. Um, I like that there's lots of shots of shadows and silhouettes and weasel's feet sort of scurrying through and we don't really get to see them properly, we just get glimpses at this point. And we get this sense that it's quite angry. This, as you can see, is, is an animation. This is a hand, I believe they've got a handheld camera here and a few shots like that in the film. And it works, it works. Yeah. There's scary music as well to accompany. Beautifully directed, um, almost echoes the terror of um, Snow White in the Disney classic, going through the woods, seeing all these shapes and things. I know that Brian and Mark were very influenced by Disney and all the, the big American studios. And this just kind of suggests that thing of kind of animals sensing things and uh, communicating on a level that, that, that we can't. Um, and again, echoes the animal nature. I mean, I have talked about them all as human characters, but of course they still have animal traits. Mole, mole lives underground, um, so he's he's in a kind of an unnatural setting, same with Ratty, but of course he's. He's discovering everything. Mole, Mole's like a child in that sense. He's discovering the world around him. Ratty, being a water rat, uh, naturally lives by the river. Um, but he has a house that resembles a house that a human being would live in. Um, so even though in the book he, it suggests he lives in a hole in the, in the river bank, and even though when we first meet Ratty, he appears, we emerges out of that hole, it's kind of where his boat is moored under the house. So they've got this wonderful sort of combination. Toad, of course, lives in a stately home, uh, true to the book. Um, but of course, being a, a riverbank creature, the, the, his home is right by the river. And Badger, look, of course, uh, lives underground in the wildwood. Um, so yeah, all very true to to where they would live as animals. Another handheld live action shot there. Creeping through. And what's wonderful about this scene is the absolute contrast already to the scenes that we've already had. Scenes of happiness and jolliness. And I think back to the open road scene, you know, not, not so long ago. And here we are in the wild wood. So we've already got that real extreme, um, you know, darkness and all sunshine and darkness. So that contrast that that is so key to the wind of the willows and indeed life itself. Um, some of these costumes still exist. Mole's scarf, Mole's balaclava. Um, wonderful that they've been preserved. Not all of them, not all of them are in the archive, but quite a few. That is again true to the book, a little bit quicker in the film, but of course things need to move on at a faster pace. Uh, but that's indeed what does happen in the book. They um, uncover um, you know, the door, door scrape and so on. 
a bit weird that our side patches there. And now, of course, that's Michael Orton's voice. Beautiful puppet. Look at the way these puppets are sculpted. I mean, Badger, particularly. Absolutely beautiful sculpt. The attention to detail and all the, the fur and the, and you know, making him look, you know, grandfatherly. He's like a, he's like the grandfather of the glasses and so on. He looks old, um, but he's still a badger. I mean, what a wonderful combination. He's a badger and yet he's an old man as well. A wise, grumpy old man. Um, but. I like the scale, I like that he's made bigger than the other characters because when you think of them as animals, badgers are of course bigger animals than moles, rats and toads. Um, but it doesn't look odd, it, it, you totally accept it, you still accept them as human-like characters. And it just works, it just works so well. There's badger set, another cosy scene uh, by the fire. Um, so again, echoing that warmth. Um, but the, the characters are sculpted by um, uh, Brian Cosgrove and also Bridget Appleby, who is very key to Cosgrove Hall's history, um, involved in designing and devising many, many shows. Uh, but in these days, uh, yeah, she sculpted, um, I believe she sculpted Badger and, and Ratty, because I know Brian Cosgrove had done Toad and Mole. It's slightly less fairy creatures or toad of course. Um, I mean they had latex skins and latex suits characters like toad more than it does fairy creatures like the others but it but it still works beautifully well. Um, I like shots like this because it, it gives us a chance to appreciate the props and Badger's home. <laughs> Easel still exists, the, the art easel at the back there. Um, now this again, this this scene again it's in the book but there there's a lot more to it in in the book. Uh, we see hedgehogs that come in um, and Ratty and Mole stay for quite some time uh, during the winter. And Badger is talking about having words with Toad about his reckless driving, putting an end to it. But he talks about dealing with it in the spring. Naturally, Badger's hibernate in the winter. He wants to wait until winter is over. But the difference with the film is it's the next morning. <laughs> so we see the snow the next morning. So, but again, the film needs to move on and it needs that kind of faster pace. And, um, but we don't question it, it absolutely works. And it sets up the series as well. I mean, we can't always keep Badger hibernating and staying away during the winter. Uh, we need all of these creatures to be out and about at all times of the year. I love the animation. Lovely animation of Toad here. <laughs> so here we see the interior of Toad Hall. Now this is one of the biggest sets Costco ever did for anything. I mean it was huge and um, I'll try and put pictures up of it. But again, I was, I was talking to Terry Brown, he was actually the first person I interviewed for the research I'm doing. Um, and Terry, like I say, he came from the theatre background and he was brought on specifically for The Wind and the Willows and stayed with Costco Hall for five years, primarily working on the series, but also uh, Creepy Crawlies. He was involved a little bit with um, Count Duckler, various things, and designed exhibitions for them. But he designed Toad Hall. I mean, I mean, look at the um, if you look at the sheer size of it. I mean, I know it's hard to appreciate in the context of the film, but I've got some images that show um, you know the crew with the with the set. It's just huge. It must be 
wonderful to in animating in that set. Um, and it's all the props as well, the paintings, the statues, the shields at the top there, and all the, all the woodwork at the top there. I mean, absolutely beautiful. And it had removable walls, so if you had to animate in one wall, the other wall would be removed, so you'd get in, you'd have access as animators. Um, and of course the roof would be removable, so if you had shots looking up, that would be placed on and so on. Um, so it's very well thought out. Uh, but then, having said that, there's things they would do differently today. Having spoke to Terry and, and various other people, they were still quite naive in those days. They were young, naive, enthusiastic people learning together. And it still amazes me that this came when it did. You know, 1983, Koskovo had only been going for, what, seven years? Um, it's not a lot, a huge amount of time. I mean, seven years since Chilton and the Wheelies. And you look at Chilton the Wheelies, still beautiful, wonderfully crazy and anarchic, but so, so modestly simple. You know, you, you look at the contrast between this and that, it's incredible um, how, how they moved on in such a short space of time. And uh, the fact that this, this series went on for so long, um, and as you'll see as we we'll look at them, the episodes one by one, it's amazing how it evolved, you know, and how. If you look at the later episodes, the animation just became so much cleaner and, um, you know, but they were learning. Like I say, they were just learning and doing the best they could. Uh, but what wonderful results, and of course it won numerous awards this film, including that year's uh, BAFTA. <laughs> and I love this animation here. It's often more challenging to do animation that isn't uh, dialogue driven because you've got less to work with. When you had dialogue, you've got, you know, you've got a blueprint there, you've got something to actually work with. But when it's an action like this, like Toe, you know, reenacting driving in his bedroom using props, you've just got to time it out and kind of have a really strong idea of, of how he would behave. It all comes to acting it out. And I know Barry has said before, he would become Toad and end the day looking like Toad. <laughs> Um, you just got to become those characters to understand them and get the frame by frame movement. Toad's bedroom, that set, is one we see, we'll see quite often in the, in the series. Um, and of course it wouldn't have existed as part of the overall structure of the set, it would have been a separate set in itself. You know, very common practice today. Um, there are many rooms in total that we, we don't see, uh, but many that we do. This is Toe being classic Toe, pretending to be ill, or, you know, <laughs> getting very true to the book. <laughs> look at the lip sync on that and the eyes, you know. I mean, Toad, the Toad puppet had um, paddles all through the mouth and cheek cheek joints so you could get smiles and frowns and so on. Um, yeah, very complex armature and all of them were, you know, Marl had cheeks that would move up and down. Ratty, you would insert an allen key into his ear and it would make the cheeks go up and down and so on. Um, that makes sense, doesn't it, to put an allen key in an ear in, into the hole. And I've worked with puppets like that on Fifi and so on, very similar setup. But this is where that, that it first began. They first developed it on the wind and the wave. <laughs> I love the te that attention to detail as well. All the car parts are still there, covered in snow. <laughs> um, that cap that Toad is wearing still exists today. And that suit he's wearing is very, I would say, iconic. Um, although having researched the series recently and looked at, you know, because there are a lot of costumes in the Coscovo archive that exist today, um, not everything, but I think it's probably about two thirds of what exists. And, um, and I've been in identifying, uh, you know, which costumes were used in which episodes and so on. And this check suit, even though it is iconic, it doesn't actually pop up that often, uh, certainly not in the later series so much. Um, but I, I tend to associate Toad with that red and white um, suit um, and it's so beautiful and it comes up in so much 
you know, so many of the images and the, the merchandise that came out is the kind of most common costume for Toad. And I believe there were two of them, those costumes, um, one of which exists in the archive. And there was a miniature version made for the miniature Toad puppet that also exists. So here we are, the first interaction with human characters, and as you can see, they are at the, the same scale. Very posh, kind of British voice, isn't it? <laughs> Very English. Oh, I say what? <laughs> that kind of voice. Uh, Reggie, his name is, voiced by Jonathan Cecil. And Toad driving up in his car. Which, of course, is what starts all the trouble for Toad. Um, not so sure about these other characters, but the policeman there. Believe it or not, still exists today. The puppet um, he's in a bit of a state because latex skins don't survive over time. So anyone in stop motion knows that maybe too well. They do unfortunately um, degrade over time. They don't survive. Uh, but the armature and the costume is still on the armature, and you can see it's him. He's got that sort of fat, <laughs> fat face in the armature, but just bits of foam left, and that's it. When I say latex, it's foam latex. And of course, those, that foam latex is cast in the mould that would be made from the original clay sculpts. And, uh, and having spoken to Bridget, interview Bridget, she was involved, heavily involved in the painting. And the paints they use, I can't remember what she said they were, but um, I'll try and put a note up at some point. But she said the paints they use are actually dangerous. I don't know what, what she means by that, but maybe dangerous to the skin, dangerous to breathe in. I don't know, they'll probably do it differently today, but again, they were learning. Um, but yeah, she said the paints would stain the clothes. Um, and even now, looking through, when I look through the costumes for the archive, some of them, like I pick up a jacket that belonged to Toad, you know, I just see little remnants of, of green paint slightly around the edge, and you know, that's, that's where it was contact with the, the skin. Um, this is a very moving scene. This is. Um, Mole missing his home, and we feel for him, we really do. Because home is important to all of us. So we relate to these characters, all of them. Um, I think that's part of the success of the, the book and this, this series, the, the film and so on. It's because all of them, we, we, we understand all those characters. You know, I like to think there's a bit of all of them in every one of us. Uh, and we certainly know people like each of them you know they all have very good qualities and um, yes toad has got some bad qualities but at the end of the day he's a good character he's a good person he's a good friend and let's face it he's the most enthusiastic he's optimistic he's he loves life he loves discovering new things and, and the others are all so loyal um, so they've all got these wonderful traits. I mean, Mole, if you think of Mole, he's very lo a very loving, gentle, loyal friend. And he loves his home. You know, he loves his underground home. Ratty. Um, Ratty, if you think about it, is, is the only character who doesn't change in this story. Mole's changed because he's discovered new things. He's discovered new friends, the outdoors and so on. Badger changes because he ventures out more. He becomes more sociable. He isn't to begin with, but he, he is by the end. And Toad, of course, changes. He um, learns a little bit about where he's gone wrong. It doesn't change completely because the series is, um, as we'll see in the series, he goes on to have many, many more crazies. Um, but he does change. Um, but Ratty is the only one who doesn't, if you think about it. He, he doesn't change. He's... So he's an interesting character in that respect. He's very, um, I guess, sure about himself, very sure about his surroundings. He's a boat-loving water rat and he'll always remain that way. So you could argue Ratty is almost the, um, the linchpin, I guess you could say. The kind of, the one that has brought the others together, in a way, I guess. And without Ratty, they wouldn't all be friends. So I mentioned the songs before, this is the next song here, again true to the book. In the book this song is simply called Carol, 
um, and it's kind of made that way. It's also kind of known as Delcy Duman, which is the title of this chapter. Um, and talking about the order of things again and how it relates to the book, the actual order of the chapters is shifted a bit in the, in the film. Um, I'm just going to make sure I get this right. I believe in the, the book, this chapter, this whole uh, scene of um, the field mice singing carols at Mole End, Mole going back to his home and so on, follows uh, leaving badgers after the wild woods scene. So this takes place before um, they uh, face Toad and lock him in his bedroom. I'll have to check the book again, but yeah, you've got Wayfarers all in there as well, of course, and the Piper at the Gates of Dawn, those chapters. So to make for the film to make sense, they shifted things a bit, but it absolutely works, and it still feels true to the book. This is a very iconic scene, very iconic scene, and I love that it's in there, and the melody of the song, of the carol, beautifully done again. Um, reprised actually in an episode in the series that we'll come to in, in due course. Keep coming back to this warmth, um, this coziness. So we've had coziness in Ratty's house, Badger's house, and now in Mole Inn. I love the Mole Inn set. Some beautifully crafted sort of woodwork in there. I believe it's wood. Um, don't actually know for certain, but um, all of these sets actually. Uh, when the series ended, uh, there was a big exhibition at the Albert Dock in Liverpool called Animation World. It was meant to be permanent, but um, unfortunately it closed only after a few years. No idea why. Um, I mean, it was around that time that Thames Television lost their franchise and Cosmo 4, being a subsidiary of Thames, um, obviously suffered greatly and it was a terrible time. And this was in 1992, I believe, 92, 93. Very worrying time for them. Uh, the Wind of the Willows series that ended in 1990, so um, they obviously had all these puppets, sets, props, loads of material, and it all went to an exhibition along with uh, original artwork from Danger Mouse, Count Duckler and the BFG. And it's, you could argue that those four projects are what Costco 4 were kind of best known for. And there's this wonderful exhibition, I never got to go, but I've seen footage of it, Terry Brown designed it, so he had some wonderful photographs from it. And he told me that all, all the sets, because they had all the sets sort of laid out, uh, with the lights on and so on, puppets in there and so on, and you could walk around and see the sets. But when the exhibition closed, they all sold to a chap in Weymouth, apparently. Who knows where they are now, but um, Mole End would have been one of them, and the Riverbank and Toad Hall. And you just think, gosh. Where they looked after, I've looked everywhere, I've looked into things, I, I haven't found any trace of them, no one else has, so maybe they don't exist anymore, maybe they're all thrown, thrown away, very, very sad, because they are beautiful set. Um, this of course is the courthouse. Um, this was used uh, once, once more in the series, in an episode called Buried Treasure, which of course will come to in due course. And then you have sets like this, just walls and things that are made specially. I mean, look at the darkness now compared with the joys of the riverbank. You know, there's such contrast. So it hits, hits things on every level. The jailer, uh, his costume still exists today. And even the head moulds, because the heads were obviously the key things that were sculpted. The, the moulds exist today for all the human characters, which is wonderful. Now this scene, um, there's actually footage of Barry directing this uh, in a documentary called Danger Mouse and Friends. Uh, you can find it on YouTube, um, but in its entirety, uh, you can find it on the Danger Mouse box set, the yellow one, not the silver one. It's the yellow one that was released for Danger Mouse's 30th anniversary, and it's a documentary delves into Danger Mouse and various other projects. And The Wind in the Willows was in production of this film. And there's footage of that scene just then of, of Barry 
um, directing Toad, sorry, animating in Toad, Toad in prison and being directed by Chris Taylor. And you can see the bar sheets, so all the soundtrack is broken down and you, as you're animating, you're looking at the vowels and the consonants and you, you, you're planning your animation around that. And what struck me is I recognised the bar sheets instantly because they are identical to the ones that I used on projects that I animated on at Costco of All, including Fifi in the Town, Flower Tots, Rupert Bear, Postman Pat and so on. It's all the same, so they've never changed. It's quite extraordinary, really, because they work. So we, here we have another uh, a famous actress, Una Stubbs, um, probably most famous for, for To Death, To Death of Stupid Heart. Um, she voiced in the jailer's daughter. The human characters, I mean, they do work. Um, sometimes they feel a little bit out of place. Again, I, I, I mean, I believe the scale thing works. And so you look at scenes like that, you've got a huge toe with this huge head. But it, it works. But the, the look of the human characters kind of echoes the previous projects like Cinderella. Pipe of Hamlin as well, even Cockle Shell Bay, they've almost got that simplistic look, but developed enough uh, to be a little bit more sophisticated for the lip sync and so on. Um, now the humour, as we get into the series, humour, um, there's touches of it in the film, again echoing the book, because the book is actually very humorous. Uh, but it's developed so brilliantly in the series. I mean, when we get to Brian Truman's scripts, and particularly with the Weasels, who are, as I say, are a double act in the series, so many wonderful, memorable scenes with them. Uh, and quite adult, some of the humour. Um, kind of humour that not very young children would understand or appreciate, uh, which is a reason why I can watch them today and still find them incredibly funny. <laughs> it's just... Again, we'll get into that as, as we come to them. This is quite a dark scene, so we see here. This always struck me as a child. We're looking at Badger there, and you wonder, is he, is he dead? You know, is he, he's not moving. And you, know, so you see a puppet, you know, that's what a puppet is like when it's not being animated. It's very kind of quite haunting, really. <laughs> I like that. Right, me too. Years later, he's counting the days down. I don't know why I didn't get that when I was a child, but he's obviously crossing days off. Days that he's been in prison. So, as you can see by the wall, he's already been there for quite some time. But he's in good spirits, despite that. No, look at that pose that Toad has there. That's typical attention to detail from Barry there. You know, getting the weight right, the weight is on the correct foot. There's a beautiful silhouette, line of action for Toad, and he's, it's readable as a pose. Um, and that's something I really picked up on from Barry when I was animating. And even the pose there, you know, very clear. Um, and any poses that Barry does, you can always tell in the merchandise and so on when it's a Barry pose. Um, other, other poses might be a little more cluttered and a bit messier. Barry knew what he was doing. And with the eyes as well, you've got these very expressive big eyes that Toad had. Um, you can see how he's got slightly closed eyes here and it's just right for the emotion. And Toad once said he doesn't have any ears. So if Toad hears something, how do you show that? You've got these eyes to play with, the eyes would circle like that, the face follows and so on. There's examples of that in the series again that we can touch on. I love this. <laughs> Old chap. <laughs> I love it. What's that? Gap between him thinking, oh chap, realizing. <laughs> so, very iconic Toad in his washerwoman outfit helping him to escape. Now, I mentioned the Further Adventures of Toad, which was a chapter in the book, 
uh, which goes into Toad sort of in his washerwoman outfit trying to get to Toad Hall there's an episode mainly built around that uh, and yes it was it became the first episode of the series which we'll come to eventually um, <laughs> and here we go trying to get a train ride of course the engine driver's costume exists today all of it the shirt the jacket everything now this david jason here hey oh uh yeah oh, any amount of them <laughs> all right that's again so just that that's a wonderful um hint of the humor to come in the series just that hey that david jason doing so at his best i think i love this how the music has come in now and we're getting into we've we've heard this music before but we haven't heard it sung yet Straight out of the book, that is. Um, so again, that's the fourth of five songs. Uh, wonderful song, beautiful melody. Now this, uh, I believe, doesn't take place in this scene in the book, but it just makes sense for it to, to be sung during his escape. Now you notice all the cloth, the fabric sort of flapping in the wind there. That, that was all done with wires. I mean, I've done animation like that on various series where you need a piece of alley wire inside or underneath the fabric so you could bend it um, and flap it uh, frame by frame. Uh, obviously, you need to put it in so that it can't be seen. Um, but that's how they would have done that. And if you look at these shots with the train, uh, I believe it, the train would have actually been fixed and the background would have moved. That's probably the way that would have been done. Um, makes more sense to do that than to have a train moving with the camera mounted to it. I mean, both ways have been practiced in model animation. Uh, <laughs> the fingers. So as I was saying, that around this point is where Toad would have gone into the woods and found somewhere to sleep. We believe, you know, he's still far away from home. But of course, in the film, he's looking out, and we we can see that he's looking at Toad Hall, and he's saying home at last. So we believe, from watching the film, if we're not super too familiar with the book, that he's just hopped off the train, the railway is nearby, and he's made it to Toad Hall. Well, the episode obviously suggests otherwise. So when you know the series and the film as a whole, you understand that. There's a passing of time there, um, and again, it works both ways. Um, but one day, I'm thinking of trying to edit the episode into it, <laughs> into the film, seeing if it works. It'd be quite interesting. Um, you can kind of see that that's a miniature ratty and a miniature toad. There's a slight different look to it. Ratty's got a slightly more squashed face. Um, Look at when you think of how small that prop would have been, that, that jigsaw puzzle, tiny pieces. Sometimes they might have animated with tweezers. I mean, I've animated with tweezers before. Um, just to pick up tiny objects. Now some people outside of animation often wonder, you know, how do you keep puppets stuck to the, the set? Uh, but there's two methods. Generally there's uh, tie-downs, which are like little um, kind of rods that you screw into the feet and then you need to drill holes into the set and fit them through. A little bit time consuming, but it means that you've got absolutely um, fixed poses. Fiddly if a character's walking, you obviously have to keep replacing them and when each foot comes down, you need to put them back in. 
but the other method, which is what I believe they used on this, uh, is to use magnets. So the set floors have to be thin enough for the magnet strength to work. So obviously the feet of the puppets are, um, have metal plates in them so that the magnets can attract them. Um, and that's the method I've used primarily in well, pretty much everything I worked on at Costco for. When I worked at Ardman, the preferred method is tie downs for um, various reasons. So I've used both methods and yeah, they've both got their pros and cons. Really. Now, notice there are, there are shots where Toad Hall's kind of in the distance and um, we see lights. They made a lot of miniatures of Toad Hall. Um, so there was one, obviously, one full-size one, but I, I believe they didn't make the whole length. Terry Brown was telling me it's only a section of it, so he used for all those scenes actually shot at Toad Hall with the puppets. But for all those wide shots, there were miniatures made, I guess they're about this big, and Terry said that there were a lot of them. Uh, and some of them were lit up, so fitted with electric wires, light bulbs and so on, and others were. So, and like I say, false perspective is something that commonly used today. We certainly did it on Shaun the Sheep, a lot of miniature barns and trees and things, and put them in front of the camera, and they look like they're much further away than they actually are, because they're made in, in miniature. So it's all about how you deal with that false perspective, how you light it, and so on. So, meeting the Council of War. <laughs> that scarf that Badger has, uh, that Czech scarf, popped up in so many episodes, particularly in the early series, and still exists today. It's still in that exact position <laughs> that it was all those years ago. Wonderful that, that a lot of the costumes have survived, and in wonderful condition as well. Now, I hate to criticise it, but there's an awkward cut coming here. If you look at the position of Toad here, yeah. continuity went a bit wrong there, but you can't, <laughs> can't fault Cosgrove at all. Very few faults, I think, in this film. Um, <laughs> another lovely shot of Toad here, just kind of getting up to things, looking at the telescope. And, let the others get on with it. And this has never made sense to me. He's looking at something in the distance, some ducks. They were just looking at Toad Hall, and then he sees Mole. But of course, Mole would be much closer than that. The test. <laughs> it works, though, doesn't it? I'm being too critical. <laughs> nice shot of animation again of Toad looking embarrassed. And he doesn't know where to look. That's probably the, the widest shot we've had in Ratty's house. We really get to see it. I love that. Even the top section there, like a like a beam in the roof there. Now all the sets, all the interiors are beautifully designed and so again in keeping with you know, the characters, the, the, the characters of, who live in them. You know, Ratty's house is a typical sort of feels like a boating house, isn't it? By the river. It's with a plain white <laughs> and this thing that Mole did about saying to the weasels there's going to be a hundred badgers, hundred rats and so on I never quite got it, I never quite understood um, and do you know what, I still don't quite understand it it's in the book, I, I read it back and I think I don't know why, I, maybe it's just me. It's probably just me being stupid, but I guess what it is is that the weasels believe there'll be a lot attacking from the front, so they'll be ready there and they won't be ready in the hall. I guess, I guess. <laughs> Typical toad again, look at these eye movements. Mistake there, he's saying ah, but his mouth is closed. They'll but pull out the stakes, but that, only because there aren't many of them. <laughs> now here we have the final song, "When the Toad Came Home," one of my absolute favourites. And again, beautifully animated. Um, It's, 
yeah, in the um, in the original book, this song is actually sung at the end. So Toad has a big party for getting back to Toad Hall, and uh, it's, it's known as or it's labelled as his last little song. But what a stroke of genius for Toad to sing it while they venture through the tunnel. It's a way of carrying them from the start of the tunnel to Toad Hall. Marvellous. Um, and those cutaways to Toad Hall to show they're getting nearer and nearer. I love this. I love the humour in this. <laughs> Bang go the drums. Wonderful. Barry just catches the weight in time there. He nearly falls over. All to do the centre of gravity. Wonderful posing there. Look. And I believe these songs, you know, the lyrics from the book have been put to music in other ways before, in other adaptations, but I think, I don't think anyone could top these. I mean, the melodies, the melodies are just marvellous. And David Jason, interestingly, hates singing. You know, the people I've interviewed, Keith Hopwood was saying how he, he believes he can't sing at all. And I think that's one thing he didn't enjoy so much on this project. And, and of course, there are more songs in the series that he, he was asked to sing and he kind of had to sing as part of the contract you know um and he yeah he doesn't like singing but as keith hopwood would always say to him but david when you do it in the toad voice it's absolutely perfect because as toad it would be right for it to not be quite right but you listen to him it's absolutely bang on the money he sings in tune um and it's perfect for that character but apparently he, he always dreaded recording a song <laughs> And the songs were generally recorded in um, in studios. I think they went down to London a few times to record them, and then invariably they'd have them up in Manchester. I mean, because a lot of the actors were based in London anyway, it made more sense to meet them there in a, in a recording studio. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of it was done up up the north, not in Manchester, but just outside Manchester, at uh, the studios that Keith had, had set up uh, called Pluto, Pluto Studio. Um, and if you want to go to his website, uh, www.plutomusic.com, you'll find um, uh, all about the history of the studios there. And of course, you can buy the soundtrack uh, to the film and the series. Now that's an interesting touch, that the door that spins around. Um, not sure that was ever in. But, but. Lovely touch. Better wait before the aftermath. Others, ye, ye hundred badgers singing all those rats and the death all glory toads. <laughs> or we could do with a few more moles. I mean, Toad absolutely becomes a dominant character in the movie. Really, yeah. Everybody loves Toad. Even though he can be a nasty character. I mean, again, David Jason has described in, in interviews, which I'll put up on here again, but he'll, he, he used to say that... Um, you know, if you look at him in the book, he's quite a nasty character, and you wonder why the other characters are friends with him. Uh, because he's so nasty and, and selfish. But what David puts into his voice is a childlike quality. You know, there's, a, there's a child in there, um, and it's, therefore we can forgive him. You know, and, and we, we still like him, we like him very much. But we understand why the others like him. Uh, he's still still a good person deep down, you know, and it's, there's a lot of naivety there, and um, so what a wonderful way to observe that character, and it's, it's the genius of, of uh, David Jason, or Sir David Jason, now so. Now this fighting scene, I think, would have been very complicated to a shot, you know, when you've got lots of puppets, like, with shots like that, lots of things moving, they would have taken time, and I only know that too well, it wasn't animated. Um, it mostly works. There's some shots where the impact doesn't quite work. You really know how that weasel falls over there. Noel doesn't seem to do much. And Ratty doesn't shoot at him. He shoots up. Uh, I love these chandelier shots. Uh, obviously, they would have been rigged in a certain way. We haven't really talked about rigging, but rigging is where things are rigged, <laughs> but out of shot, so that they can move in a certain way. The caravan in the open road to get it rocking like that would have been rigged a particular way. And things like those chandeliers, you know, a lot of engineering would have gone into how that's animated and moved out of shot. 
more shots of it here. Fucking jacket again, so more of my work. I was never quite convinced with the way Badger batters the weasels, and this shot here doesn't quite work. There we go, Toad landing on the nose of the cheap <laughs> I love this, I'm totally losing this, this ending. The four characters all cheering. Backwards, backwards flag animation again. The whippers have to go that the opposite way, always to keep flags up. Learning that. <laughs> I love the reflection of Total there, beautifully composed. It's just so beautifully shot, the whole film. I mean, it's just every shot is composed so meticulously. I mean, Mark Hall, I mean, this was Mark Hall's baby. You know, you had Brian and Mark, and the two of them, Brian was more of the, you know, centered around the 2D side. You know, when, when you think of Brian, you think more of Danger Mouse. Mark's more wind in the willows. Um, and it's not just that they were the key projects they worked on, they, the projects themselves encapsulate who those men were. You know, Mark was a gentler man, I guess, in some ways, and Brian was um, more of a workaholic. And they were both workaholics, but um, Mark loved the adaptations. Now, this scene wasn't in the book. The Cosgrove of War added this, and they thought of this, and it has been replicated or used in other adaptations and it's so perfect. Uh, we all think that Toad's completely learned his lesson and then what does he do? He appears in a plane. <laughs> what could... He's gone from caravans to cars to planes. Uh, and it's right for the period. 1908 this book was written and Cosgrove wanted to be absolutely faithful to the Edwardian period. Uh, and the Wright brothers of course were developing flight by that time so uh, what better way to, to end the film and to have tone in the play? Look at the timing here. Okay. And he's still falling. Still falling. There's the cat. I see you, chat. Fantastic ending. And here we have the iconic credits. Wonderful cast. All of them so perfect for their, their parts. And here we have the supporting cast there. I've mentioned many of them. Alan Barsley, who did the horse. Errol Reed did the magistrate, I didn't mention. There's the wonderful animators, Marge Graham. I haven't mentioned her. Uh, the sculptors constructed, so the early people who developed the puppets there. There's Terry Brown, I mentioned there. Um, who else we've got? Many of these, oh, Nigel Cornford, no longer with us, sadly, but wonderful. Costumes and I, Beverly Bush, who did the illustrations. I can't keep up the credits, can't, can't mention all. We've mentioned the composers, Brian Ibbotson, did a great job of arranging music. Joe Dembinski, I know. Frank Hardy, he actually not only did the rostrum camera, he actually was a carpenter. He made the caravan um, and many other things. The editors, Nips, I've, I've met a few times. John Hambly was very key to Thames Television, so he was the link between Thames and Costco Hall. Mark and Brian, of course. Chris Taylor I've worked with. He directed Post and Pat when I worked on that. Lovely guy. <laughs> That's the result of that photo. Of him getting taken out of the water. And of course, Mark Hall. Like I say, this was his baby. He once signed something for me and he said this was the best he ever did. And I believe it was as well. I mean, he's, he's worked on some fantastic projects, but I don't think he ever quite topped this. Beautiful production. And there we go. So thank you, thank you for joining me on this this commentary. Um, first commentary I've ever done, so hopefully it wasn't too boring. And um, you know, I tried to um, give you as much insight into the making of the film as I could, uh, and my views on it. Uh, I'd love you all to share your views. Please do get involved. Please do comment either on. You know, I'm linking this to Facebook. I'm linking it to YouTube. I'm linking it to Instagram comment wherever you know my website as well I don't mind where the comments are but I'd be so grateful for them because what I want to do is 
do a book eventually. I want this all to go in a book that celebrates this, this wonderful film and, in, and indeed the series. Um, so in this post you'll find uh, lots of uh, bits and pieces that I'd love to share with you, um, behind the scenes images and things I've spoken about that I'll, I'll try and share. And like I say, I'm going to get into the, um, the series as well, week by week. Okay, so thanks very much. So, like I say, uh, I am going to be doing these reviews, similar to the one I just did for the film. just want to explain a bit about how it's going to work. I'm not going to uh, review them in their original production order, which I know might frustrate some people, but the reason for that is a while back I sorted the episodes into a seasonal order. So, um, I want, basically the reasons for that was to um, show each episode at the time of year that it actually is in this year 2019 and of course going into 2020. I wanted to start in the spring because it it just feels right um, it's the start of a new season in this new year um, and we'll obviously go right the way through to the same time next year in 2020 finishing with uh, the winter episodes. The reason I'm sort of holding the camera here is I want to show you around here this that I've done. Now this here, I don't know if you can see it very well, I'll just try and put it there. This basically, uh, that's winter, but I'll just rotate it and you'll see spring there. Now what I've done, like I say, is I've organised all the episodes, arranged them into seasonal order, and this this wooden structure is a tower that I've, that I managed to find at a charity shop. You can see it holds all the VHS releases of the Wind and the Willows, DVD releases if I rotate it. You can see the DVDs there and so on. It goes from the bottom all the way up to the top. And um, But what this tower was, was a leaflet holder, basically. And it had other imagery on the top here, which I wanted to get rid of, obviously. I wanted to replace it with something to do with Wind in the Willows. And then I realised that I could make it into a kind of a calendar, because it's got four sides. And I realised, of course, there's four seasons. Uh, there's four characters, so hence we've got one of the main characters in each of these these windows. And I based it, this design, on the caravan. If you think about the caravan in that open road sequence, this is kind of like a side panel. And I discovered laser cutting. So this is actually a piece of wood that has been laser cut. So all this text and all these straight lines and so on have been drawn up, designed in uh, Adobe Illustrator, and then translated to a laser cutting machine. Uh, so what I did, I, I realised that in The Wind in the Willows, uh, there are four series of the original series of The Wind in the Willows, so that equates to 52 episodes, four series of 13, and of course there are 52 weeks in the year. So I thought, wow, I can allocate an episode to a week, and which is why I started arranging them in seasonal order. So I don't know if you can read that, that actually says, you go a bit closer there, The Ghost at Mole End. First one there. I don't know if you can see that. The ghost at Mole End, it's kind of side on. Week nine, as you can see, so week nine of the year, and then week ten is the storm, and so on. And they progress. And I basically went with the ghost at Mole End because that's where that's an episode where spring just starts. We go from winter into spring. And it goes all the way through to what feels right to be the last spring episode, which is Lord Toad. And as we rotate it. We've got summer there, all the summer episodes, with Ratty in the window there. I don't know why a to toad felt right for spring somehow, not just because he's green, and green's the colour of spring, but a toad's just so full of energy, full of life, and for me, spring is the season where life kind of, well, everything springs to life, doesn't it? It just makes sense. <laughs> Ratty suits summer for me because he's all about boating and being on the river, and I, I would have thought summer was the season Ratty loves best. It's where you can go out and have picnics and so on. And then as we get to autumn, that suited Mole for me. I don't know. When I think of Mole, I think of, you know, Mole making jam, having collected berries in the harvest in the autumn. Um, it just suits me. It suits Mole to the autumn, really. But as we get to winter, of course, it's Badger. The reason I went with Badger for winter is because Badgers naturally hibernate in the winter. But also, when you think of Badger's house, I just think of the cosiness, the underground, the fireplace, you know, 
And in that Brian Costco painting, Badge is painted in these beautiful sort of bluish tones, which echoes winter as well. So it just seemed to make sense to put Badger there. Now you're probably wondering, those of you who know the Wind in the Willow series well, will also know that there are 13 additional episodes, uh, basically series five, uh, otherwise known as Oh Mr Toad, so I remember them as Oh Mr Toad. So that obviously makes for an awkward number, uh, 65 episodes in total. So what I'm proposing I do is I will review, review one of those every four weeks. So in other words, there'll be a bonus episode every four weeks. So kind of roughly at the end of each month, but obviously there's 13 of them. Uh, so it won't be as 12, 12 months, so it'll be every four weeks. And of course there's the two features. So I've just reviewed the original feature. And of course there's a special, the 1989 uh, production, A Tale of Two Toads. And I am planning to do that right at the end. So I've started it off with this film and I'll finish it with the, the second film. So kind of bookending the series. So hopefully that will make sense. It makes sense to me. Um, I'm hoping it will all go really well. Um, if there's a weekend where it's difficult, I'll obviously try and record it during the week and do it that way. But I'll do my best uh, to um, stick with it week by week. Again, I'd really value any comments. I'll share as much behind the scenes material as I can. Um, and uh, yeah, a year from now, I would, I'll be through the whole series and uh, hopefully, um, there'll be a lot of interest to try and get a book together eventually. That's the plan anyway. So thanks for watching and um, I'll see you in the next video, uh, uh, The Ghost at Mole End. So look out for it on the 3rd of March, Sunday the 3rd of March. So it will be every Sunday that these will be published online. Uh, look out for it and I'll look forward to all your comments. Thanks very much and bye bye.